morning, Your Honour. Yes. Uh, I'm assuming the person on screen is uh, your instructing solicitor, is that right? Yes, that's right, Your Honour. Yes. OK, and Mr Benichatos, you're here. Thank you. B-N-E-T-A-T-O-S for the record. For Mr Pudniks, who is seated behind me. Thank you. Uh, and Mr Clifford O'Sullivan. Yes, Your Honour, I'd be on behalf of the prosecution. Yes, unfortunately I received the transcript quite late yesterday and I was hoping to give a written decision but I'm not able to do that because of the late provision of the transcript so I'm afraid you'll have to bear with me. Thank you. The uh, defendant, Mr Pudnicks, operates a paraglider for recreation. Until the 30th of August 2020, he held a certificate that allowed him to do that in particular circumstances under the aviation laws. Since then, he has continued to use his paraglider on a number of occasions. The, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, the prosecuting authority in this court, says that by doing so, he is in breach of Section 20AB of the Civil Aviation Act 1988, um, hereafter called the CAA. The onus is on the prosecuting authority to prove each allegation beyond a reasonable doubt. The resolu resolution of this case involves, in my view, determination of two questions. First, is a paraglider an aircraft for the purposes of Section 20AB CAA? Secondly, if the answer to the first question is yes, what does the phrase during flight time in section 20AB mean when applied to the operation of a paraglider. Do Mr Pudnick's activities as admitted amount to performing duties essential to the operation of an Australian aircraft during flight time? I am grateful to the parties for reducing the time required for what could have been a very lengthy hearing by the agreement of a number of facts. These proceedings were listed for two days at Katoomba Local Court. I was only required to hear evidence for one day um, and to hear evidence from two witnesses, Dr Sonia Brown, an aeronautical engineering expert, and the defendant, Mr Pudnicks. The allegations before the court are of offences on 16 occasions between 12 September 2020 and 17 May 2021. Sequences 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16 are alleged to have occurred from a launch site at Mount Blackheath. Sequence 4 is alleged to have occurred at Otford and sequences 5, 9 and 10 at Stanwell, Stanwell Tops. Exhibit 1 contains the agreed facts pursuant to section 191 of the Evidence Act 1995 New South Wales there are no facts in dispute in relation to the defendant's operation of the paraglider. He does not dispute that until 31 August 2020, he was a member of the Sports Aviation Federation of Australia, SAFA, the governing body for persons in Australia undertaking paragliding sport aviation activities. He held a PG4 pilot certificate and had accrued approximately 250 flying hours in a paraglider. When his membership of SAFA expired on 31 August 2020, his pilot certificate was automatically cancelled. The defendant knew his pilot certificate had been cancelled. He did not hold a civil aviation authorisation essential to the operation of an Australian aircraft he had not been given approval by CASA to fly a paraglider. Those are matters proved by the agreed facts at 2 to 10. He has formally agreed that on each occasion alleged in a sequence before the court, he operated the paraglider as pilot in command of the paraglider. The agreed facts contain reference to observations by witnesses on each occasion, including by other members of SAFA and on occasions of the Blue Mountains Hang Gliding Club. Those are the agreed facts at paragraphs 11 to 26. 
He was not under supervision by an instructor on any of the occasions alleged. Exhibit 2 is a statement by Mr Andrew McMurray, who is the president of the Blue Mountains Hang Gliding Club. That statement includes opinions of Mr McMurray, which are not disputed, of his own observations on 27 November 2020 and 23 January 2021, of the defendant operating his paraglider in conditions that, in Mr McMurray's opinion, were not suitable for paragliding. That statement was not objected to, however it is not an element of any of the offences before the court that the defendant was operating in unsafe conditions. Attached to Exhibit 2 is a photograph of the defendant landing the paraglider on the Mount Blackheath golf course on 23 January 2021. The paraglider operated by the defendant is agreed to weigh 10.583 kilograms. I note that a paraglider is defined in the Civil Aviation Order 95.8 so as to require it to have an empty weight of less than 70 kilograms. SAFA was the only governing body for paragliding activities in Australia at the relevant times. SAFA has the power to issue pilot qualifications and certificates. Mr Pudnicks gave evidence. There was no obligation on him to do so, um, but he did in his own defence. He said that he had undertaken all of the training required for piloting a paraglider through the club system, that he had flown roughly 500 flights in a paraglider, he has degrees in engineering and physics from the Australian National University. He described the way in which he operated a paraglider, including the necessity to run as fast as possible off a hill in order to begin his descent. And he said that in still air, he would never reach a height above the launch height. He gave evidence that that was because a paraglider is always falling and not deriving support from the reactions of the air. That evidence was contrasted with moving air, which he described as actions of the air rather than reactions, which enabled him to achieve higher altitudes. He described the use of thermal lift and ridge lift to enable a paraglider pilot to stay in the air for hours. He described the need to find thermals in order to obtain support through rising air. He was not qualified as an expert in aeronautics. Clearly, he has a great deal of experience uh, practically in paragliding. To the extent that he gave opinion evidence, it was clearly not expert evidence, uh, as contrasted with the evidence of Dr Brown. He certainly agreed in cross-examination that a glider, a paraglider, falls more slowly than a rock. And uh, he, uh, however, he maintained, and I'll come back to this, that the paraglider was not supported in the air. I turn to the offences alleged. Each offence is alleged to have been committed against Section 20 AB1 of the CAA. That provides as follows. One, a person must not perform any duty that is essential to the operation of an Australian aircraft during flight time unless A, the person holds a civil aviation authorisation that is in force and authorises the person to perform that duty, or B, the person is authorised by or under the regulations to perform that duty without the civil aviation authorisation concerned. Penalty imprisonment for two years. Subsections 2 provide, relates to maintenance and is not relevant to these proceedings. Subsection 3 provides that nothing in subsections 1 or 2 limits the power to make regulations under the Act that provide for an offence of undertaking another activity without the appropriate civil aviation authorisation or special authorisation under the regulations. Subsection 4 says in this section flight time has the same meaning as in the regulations. Section 3A of the CAA provides the objects of the Act, uh, the main object of the Act, as 
follows, the main object of this Act is to establish a regulatory framework for maintaining, enhancing and promoting the safety of civil aviation, with particular emphasis on preventing aviation accidents and incidents. Section 3 defines aircraft as follows. Aircraft means any machine or craft that can derive support in the atmosphere from the reactions of the air, other than the reactions of the air against the Earth's surface. That last exception, I note, was referred to in Dr Brown's evidence as referring generally to hovercraft, that is, reactions of the air against the Earth's surface, and nothing. there was no um, submission made uh, to the contrary in relation to that. So the relevant portion of the definition is any machine or craft that can derive support in the atmosphere from the reactions of the air. The first issue requires me to determine whether a paraglider is an aircraft as defined in section 3. If I am not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of that, the defendant is entitled to be acquitted. If I am satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that a paraglider is an aircraft, the prosecution must then prove that the defendant on each occasion operate, sorry, acted as pilot in command during flight time, as defined in the regulations pursuant to subsection 4. Determination of the meaning of flight time in the regulations, I must say, is not as straightforward as one might expect. Turning to the first question, is a paraglider an aircraft? In seeking to persuade me that a paraglider is an aircraft um, under the provisions of uh, the definition that I've just set out, Exhibit 3 was tendered being an expert report of Dr Sonia Brown, whose expertise in aeronautics is not in dispute. Whilst Dr Brown has expressed an opinion about whether a paraglider comes within the legal definition, that is a matter for me as the tribunal of fact to determine. Dr Brown gave a clear and unequivocal opinion at paragraph one of that report that, and I quote, a paraglider is a craft that produces lift for support in the atmosphere and hence fits the definition of an aircraft in the Civil Aviation Act. The paragliding wing must be inflated, situated above the pilot and connected to the pilot by lines and harness to be complete and ready for flight. In my opinion, a paraglider engages in flight and fits the definition of flight under the Civil Aviation Act for a heavier than air aircraft. Power exists when there is a change in energy and kinetic energy is created in gliders, including paragliders, via the creation of velocities. For a paraglider, this is specifically related to the takeoff ground run, generating the velocity and kinetic energy required for flight. The main aeronautical forces acting on a paraglider in flight are lift, drag and weight. Side forces applicable in side slip scenarios due to the paraglider, sorry, and side slip. Uh, side forces applicable in side slip scenarios due to the paraglider canopy geometry. Additionally, for takeoff, there are ground forces associated with the takeoff run by the pilot to provide the initial velocity. Gliders, including paragliders, do not have thrust. In my opinion, the Niviak Arctic 5 paragliding wing once inflated and connected in the proper configuration with pilot is an aircraft under the Civil Aviation Act 1988 Commonwealth. Dr Brown had clearly been provided with some documents which have not been tendered in these proceedings and some of her report goes to refutation of opinions contained in those. It, I would infer from the cross-examination that some of what was put to Dr Brown in cross-examination may have come from those other documents and essentially the defendant relies on cross-examination of Dr Brown about her opinions to persuade me that a paraglider does not derive support in the atmosphere from the reactions of the air. 
When I say that, I don't suggest there is any onus on the defendant to prove that. The onus is on the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to my satisfaction that uh, a paraglider does meet that definition, but in the absence of expert evidence um, on behalf of the defendant, uh, I have to consider the matter on the basis of Dr Brown's evidence generally. In particular, the defendant sought to challenge Dr Brown's opinion that support is provided um, by uh, reactions Sorry, that support is provided um, by reactions of the air. Um, even if support is provided, it was submitted that it is not reactions of the air that provide that support. The paraglider is made up of two layers of a light fa fabric which is first directed by the pilot so as to catch the wind in a way which results in ram air filling the gap between its upper and lower fabric surfaces, which are divided by ribs. Dr Brown indicated that in the photograph showing the defendant and his paraglider attached to Exhibit 2, she was able to observe the gap through which the ram air entered. There doesn't seem to be any question that um, that statement by her is correct. Dr Brown's evidence confirms that once inflated by ram air, a paraglider is a wing. She described that as a three-dimensional object made up of aerofoils. Uh, the aerofoils are the cross-sectional geometry that results in the air moving over the geometry faster than the air below the geometry, creating a higher pressure below the wing causing an upward force which is called lift and that's at paragraph 11 of her report. At paragraph 12 to 13 she said lift provides the support for the paraglider to remain in the air and is specifically generated from the wing's interactions with the air. The wing is supported by the attached weight, typically the person operating the vehicle, by connecting lines to maintain its shape for flight. Lift is generated by pressure, which is from the wing's interaction with the air, and pressure is considered a reaction, as it is caused by the air molecules impacting the surface. Dr Brown's report and her evidence went into some detail in support of these opinions. She was unshaken in cross-examination. I note that um, she, in cross-examination, talked about the pressure difference, the velocity moving over the top being faster. She said it comes back to effectively what we call the conservation of mass, which is what creates the faster velocity over the top and the slower velocity under the bottom, which comes back to Bernoulli's principles, which say the pressure plus half the density velocity squared is constant is what causes the velocity over the top. The pressure has to be lower at the top with a faster velocity based on Bernoulli's, therefore the air moving slower at the bottom is the higher pressure and it's the result of those two, the pressure differential, the low pre lower pressure above and the higher pressure below which creates that lift force up. That's essentially an answer she gave at the top of page 38 which was describing what it was that was happening in the air which resulted in lift. As I say, she was unshaken in cross-examination about the opinions which I've quoted from her report um, and uh, there, were some, there was some cross-examination about um, examples that were given by Dr Brown but essentially her evidence was uh, that it was lift that kept the paraglider in the air and lift was created by that, uh, act, that uh, pressure differential as described in the paragraph I've just quoted. Two arguments were put against Dr Brown's clearly expressed opinions about what I could describe as the physics of flight as applied to a paraglider when one is talking about 
support and the actions or reactions in the air. First, it was submitted that the term support in the definition requires that an aircraft has to be able to be stopped from falling as a consequence of the operation of the air. It was submitted that support is an absolute term and that a thing is either supported or not. The requirement it was submitted therefore does not include when a glider is descending or indeed when it's flying because as long as the glider is falling, it is not deriving support from the reactions of the air. It was indeed submitted that the definition of an aircraft only captures an aeroplane, not a non-motorised craft. Dr Brown clearly did not agree with that proposition. That submission was made, notwithstanding the clear intent in the Act and Regulations, to apply those regulations to non-motorised craft as set out in some of the definitions that I'll extract below uh, when, and for example in part 200 of the Civil Aviation Safety Regulations. Some non-motorised craft are required to be registered and pilots are required to be licensed, for example traditional fixed wing gliders. In addition, the definition itself includes both, sorry, the definition of aircraft itself includes both a machine and a craft. I was referred to a number of dictionary definitions of the word support. I'm required to give some meaning to that word in CAA section 3, but in my view, many of the examples used in the definitions quoted on behalf of the defendant were entirely inapposite to aircraft generally. For example, counsel for the defendant referred to a book being supported by a table and the defendant's evidence made the same point at page 47 where he uh, talked about support is to withstand without giving way. He gave the example of a bridge. He says, said, if I drive across a bridge and I believe that's going to support me, that's a great thing. But if as I was driving across the bridge, it began to descend at one metre per second, second, I'd be a little worried. In the same way, if I asked my friend to stand on a chair above some lava and I say, don't worry, the chair will support you, as my friend sinks into the lava at minus one metre per second, they might question, what did you mean? Um, he said, that's the kind of meaning I have from the word support. It was uh, put to him, you accept though, that the glider gliding at dawn in still air has a slower rate of descent than a rock in free fall. And he agreed with that. Um, but he said he gave other examples such as wingsuits or hang gliders or sailplanes and said a rock is at one end of the spectrum, paraglider is third below a hang glider and a sailplane. He said as to what we call support or not, I suppose it's an interpretive question under the dictionary. Um, certainly Mr uh, Pudnick's agreed after some further questioning uh, that uh, rock, if you had to pick an object of staying in the air the long, longest without driving support, he said rock is probably not your best option. I certainly accept that um, the notion of support as referred to by Mr Pudnix in his evidence and by counsel in his submissions uh, is one meaning that that word can have. One of the definitions that was quoted was from the Oxford English Dictionary, which was said to include carry the weight or part of the weight, hold up, keep from falling or sinking. The primary definition of fall is a dropping down by the effect of gravi gravity. The whole purpose of a glider is to slow the effect of gravity so that a person attached to a glider does not in fact fall, but rather glides. The defendant in his evidence said that his longest flight in a paraglider had been six hours during which he travelled 110 kilometres in distance. In my view he could not possibly have done that without the support provided by the atmosphere to the wing above his body. 
in my view, the difference between a glider and an aeroplane for the purposes of the definition of aircraft in the CAA is one of degree, not one of kind. I accept that a paraglider cannot be supported by actions of the air or reactions of the air in the atmosphere indefinitely. Neither, of course, can an aeroplane uh, without um, refuelling. So, in my view, there is no relevant distinction there. The, as I say, the definition is in. Sorry, the difference between a glider and an aeroplane is one of degree, not of kind. I, accepting, as I do, the evidence of Dr Brown, together with what I regard as the ordinary English meaning of the word support, I find that a paraglider is supported by air in the atmosphere because its whole purpose is to stop the um, pilot falling uh, only due to the effects of gravity. The second argument put was whether the support was, if I found that to exist, was provided by reactions of the air. It was sought to draw a distinction on behalf of the defendant between actions and reactions. I note that Dr Brown, as I've already quoted, used the word interactions and, of course, one might think that interactions might encompass both actions and reactions, um, but Dr Brown's view was clearly that what was uh, occurring when a wing moves through the air, displacing the air molecules and causing the difference in pressure referred to, um, was that it's the reaction of the air to the wing that is holding the wing and pilot up. To describe that as an action rather than as a reaction as sought on behalf of the defendant ignores, in my view, and based on Dr Brown's evidence, uh, what is actually happening when a glider moves into the air after reaching an appropriate velocity for the pressure di differential to support the wing. Action is taken by the pilot to reach that velocity. Once that is achieved, the reactions of the air provide support. Dr Brown went into detail in her evidence and in particular in cross-examination, some of which I've already quoted. She certainly agreed that for a paraglider, it is the pilot who does the work to attain flight. I note that uh, she also said sorry, at page 36 um, that it was... Uh, She uh, said that essentially, as I've already quoted, that um, it was the wing and the pilot together who made up the paraglider, but it was the reactions of the air to the moving wing that provided lift, which was the essence of flight. She was entirely unshaken in cross-examination about that as well. I accept her opinion. I accept that a wing does derive support in the atmosphere from the reactions of the air, notwithstanding that the support does not permit a vehicle without thrust to remain in the air indefinitely. As Dr Brown said, a paraglider does not have thrust in flight. However, its passage through the air creates lift. The pressure differential on the upper and lower sides of the wing are reactions of the air and uh, the fact that there may be other actions of the air, such as, for example, thermals, does not change the fact that it is reactions of the air to the wing as it moves through the air that allow it to remain aloft. Indeed, the logical conclusion of the argument put on the defendant's behalf is that an aeroplane ceases to be an aircraft for the purposes of the Civil Aviation Act if its engine or engines stop. An aircraft of whatever type which is gliding is deriving support by the change in pressure of the air above and below it as the wing passes through the air. That change in pressure is a reaction. All that is required by the definition is the capability of support, not a, the fact of support, 
and it is the essence of flight that a wing does provide support in the atmosphere as long as it is moving through it. A paraglider, as set out in Dr Brown's report, is a wing once filled with ram air. In my view, the definition is clearly made out and I am satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that a paraglider is an aircraft for the purposes of the Civil Aviation Act. I therefore turn to the question of whether the defendant operated the paraglider during flight time. There are two relevant regulations under the Civil Aviation Act. First are the Civil Aviation Regulations and the second the Civil Aviation Safety Regulations 1998. Sorry, Civil Aviation Regulations 1988 uh, and Civil Aviation Safety Regulations 1998. Excuse me, reference is required to both in order to determine the meaning of flight time. I do note that these regulations have apparently changed and it appears quite significantly, at least in structure, since the last of the offences is alleged to have been committed on the 17th of May 2021. I've been provided with pointing time copies of the regulations for the purpose of determining this case. I'm informed that there was no relevant change to the regulations during the period of time covered by the allegations. At the time of these alleged offences, Part 200 made the following provisions in relation to paragliders. Uh, 200.001a um, provided that in these regulations, excluded provisions means and there are a number of uh, excluded provisions which include Part 1, relevantly, and Part 200. Subpart 200, capital B, exempted certain things from certain regulations. 200.001, sorry, 200.01, uh, says a hang glider, powered hang glider, paraglider or para paraglider used solely in private operations and only for recreational purposes or for flying training for the issue of a pilot certificate is exempt from CASR other than the excluded provisions if the conditions specified in section 95.8 of the civil aviation orders as enforced from time to time are complied with. Section 95.8 of the civil aviation orders um, provides a scheme for regulating the operation of hang gliders and other similar craft that include paragliders. The order exempts people oper operating such aircraft from the provisions of Part 61 and from licensing under Section 20AB if subsection 6 and 7 of the order are complied with. Those provisions, that is 6 and 7, are extensive but generally require the holding relevantly of a pilot certificate and place numerous restrictions on the flying of such aircraft by holders of such a certificate. For example, just by way of example, they prohibit flying at night. It is inherent in the argument put on behalf of this defendant that although the craft he was flying is assumed to be an aircraft for the purposes of that order, it is not an act, sorry, it is not an aircraft for the purposes of the act under which that order is made. Such an outcome would be surprising to say the least and for the reasons I've given already I do not consider it to be correct. Regulations 200.025 and 200.030 of the Civil Aviation Safety Regulations provide as follows. For paragraph 20 AB1A of the Act a person is taken to hold a civil aviation authorisation that is in force and authorises the person to perform a duty that is essential to the operation of an unregistered Australian aircraft during flight time if a the person holds a pilot certificate granted by a sport aviation body that administers aviation activities in the aircraft and b the person operates the aircraft in accordance with the sport aviation body's operations manual. Regulation 200.030 creates an offence and reads a person commits an offence if A, the person pilots an unregistered Australian aircraft and B, a sport aviation body, body 
administers aviation activities in the aircraft and C, the person does not, one, hold a pilot certificate granted by the sport aviation body and two, operate the aircraft in accordance with the sport aviation body's operations manual. The maximum penalty for that offence is a fine of 50 penalty units. Paragliders are unregistered. Regulation 200.030 clearly contemplates circumstances in which a prosecution could be commenced against a person such as this defendant for the activities in which he accepts he engaged. The maximum penalty for that offence is a fine, whereas the maximum penalty for each of the offences before me is two years imprisonment. That regulation does not make any reference to flight time and in any prosecution under that provision, it would not be necessary for the prosecution to prove that any relevant piloting or operation happened during flight time. The prosecution submits in these proceedings that the fa fact that the offending alleged before the court could constitute a different offence under the regulations does not affect my determination of whether it also constitutes an offence against section 20AB. Indeed, regulation 200025 clearly contemplates that it could, essentially providing a deeming provision, making lawful what may otherwise be unlawful, where a person holds a pilot certificate and operates the paraglider in accordance with the Sport Authority's operations manual. It is certainly not unusual for the same conduct to be alleged to breach more than one, more than one statutory provision with different requirements for proof. I accept that the fact that a regulatory offence, sorry, the fact of a regulatory offence being available has no impact on whether this particular offence is made out. The civil aviation regulations do not provide a definition of flight time. In order to find a definition for the purposes of section 20AB subsection 4, I uh, have been taken to the dictionary to the CASR, which appears in part one of um, the uh, regulations and which is one of the excluded provisions which applies to relevantly paragliders under regulation 201. The dictionary provides that flight time has the meaning given by regulation 61010. 61010 provides relevantly, of course it covers a number of different circumstances, but relevantly provides flight time as a pilot in command, it says C regulation 61090. It's an agreed fact that the defendant was a pilot in command. Regulation 61090 provides a person's flight time as pilot in command of an aircraft is the duration of a flight for which the person is the pilot in command of the aircraft. To understand Regulation 61, recourse may also be required to the definition of duration of a flight, uh, which is in Regulation 61.010, and again has a number of subsections, but relevantly provides duration of a flight means for a flight in a glider, the time from the moment the glider first begins moving in preparation for flight, whether being towed or not, until the moment it comes to rest at the end of a flight. This regulation refers specifically to a glider um, and it is argued by the prosecution that a paraglider is a glider for the purpose of that definition. Um, and I'm referred to regulation 200.001. Although I wasn't directed specifically to it in the course of submissions, the dictionary to CASR also at the time contained a definition of glider, which means an unpowered, heavier-than-air aircraft that derives its lift in flight chiefly from aerodynamic reactions on surfaces remaining fixed under given conditions of flight, um, and also includes another definition relating to a uh, glider fitted with an engine. 
I can only assume uh, from the fact that no reference was made in submissions to this provision that it is accepted that a paraglider meets that definition and clearly Dr Brown considered that it did uh, and indeed the terms of her um, evidence and report appear to make direct reference to it. During submissions about the relevant prin principles of statutory interpretation, I was directed to the decision of the High Court in Project Blue Sky Incorporated and Australian Broadcasting Authority 1998-153 ALR 490 and the requirement to give provisions in legislation and legislative instruments a construction that is consistent with the language and purpose of all of the provisions of the statute and that in construing a particular provision I must strive to give meaning to every word of it. It was submitted on behalf of the Pro Prosecuting Authority that Regulation 61090, being the definition of flight time, is incorporated um, into part, uh, sorry, for the purposes of this prosecution, but not anything else in Regulation 61, noting that uh, 61 generally is not applicable to paragliders. In particular, because there is no other definition of flight time in the regulations, it's argued that this definition must be intended to apply under Section 20AB4. I accept that this is correct, that it is the definition of flight time found in Regulation 61 that is what is intended to be referred to by Section 20AB4. It makes a great deal of sense when one is talking about aeroplanes, helicopters, airships and gliders for which a person is required to be licensed, but I need to determine whether the criminal sanction in Section 20AB applies to paragliders at all. The item operated by the defendant was a paraglider as defined in Regulation 200001. Accordingly, it's exempt from CASR except for the excluded provisions. It's not in dispute that the excluded provisions do not include Part 61. However, Section 2C of the Civil Aviation Regulations provide that they are to be... Sorry, the Civil Aviation Safety Regulation is to be read with and as if it formed part of the civil aviation regulations and if there's any inconsistency the safety regulations prevail to the extent of any inconsistency. One of the provisions of CASR that does apply to paragliders is part one, that being the dictionary. I won't quote the entire dictionary but uh, it refers to definitions of certain expressions. Accordingly, it's argued that notwithstanding that Part 61 does not apply to a paraglider, as the dictionary does apply to a paraglider, any relevant proportion of Part 61 is incorporated by that fact. I've already set out the definition of flight time, which appears in the dictionary and which refers a reader to Part 61. It's very clear that Part 61 could not apply to the pilots of paragliders, generally. Part 61 sets out the licensing scheme for pilots and flight engineers of registered aircraft at 61005. A paraglider is not a registered aircraft. Nevertheless, it's argued that because meaning must be given to Section 20AB4, the definition of flight time for a pilot in command, which refers a reader to, of, of the regulations to Regulation 61090, that must apply for the purposes of Section 20AB. The alternative interpretation is that not every piloted aircraft is operated during flight time as set out in the regulations and it is only when they are so operated that Section 20AB as a penal provision with imprisonment as a potential penalty can come into play. However, such an interpretation, in my view, is not harmonious with the objects of the Act. It is not harmonious with other provisions of it, such as, just by way of an uh, unrelated example, the provision in Regulation 101047 exempting balloons, kites and model aircraft from Section 20AB. Um, I note that that was extracted in Dr Brown's report at page 20. And 
is also not harmonious which, with the provisions which specifically exempt paragliders from the operation of Section 20AB in certain circumstances. Taking into account the breadth of this very extensive legislative regime, the legislature has clearly sought to permit the definition of an aircraft to include objects such as paragliders and to extend the operation of the Act and regulations to them except as specifically exempted. It has sought to impose a system requiring training and certification and the operation of paragliders within certain specified parameters. That is consistent with the objects of the Act. While I initially considered the interpretation argued for by the prosecuting authority to be a somewhat tortured path to the inclusion of paragliders in the penal provisions of section 20AB, Having had the opportunity to reflect upon the Act and regulations as a whole, I am satisfied that that is indeed their effect and that that is also the intention of the legislature. It was a, I do note that on behalf of the defendant it was argued that the definition of flight in the Civil Aviation Act is relevant to the meaning of flight time and that that does not apply to a paraglider. I do not consider that the definition of flight in the Act assists in the determination of this matter at all. Section 20AB clearly only applies to the operation of the aircraft during flight time. If the defendant's activities do not come within that definition, then the offence cannot be made out. If they do, then in my view he is clearly guilty of these offences. I find that the definition in Part 61 of the regulations is satisfied by the glider, which is made up by the combination of a pilot and paraglider, wing and harness, notwithstanding that the pilot is not required to be licensed, as set out in the balance of Part 61. On each of the occasions the subject of a court attendance notice, the defendant was at operating the paraglider during flight time. The paraglider is an aircraft, and I find the defendant guilty of each offence. Order, please. Um, Mr. Clifford O'Sullivan, is there any relevant history? No. Your Honor. No. Um, do you want to say anything in relation to? Well, sorry, Mr. Benatatos, do you have any material you want to um, no, your Honor. tender in relation to penalty? No. Do you? Uh, I was going to, but um, I'm not going to uh, tender any further material. I think it's ex accepted uh, through Mr Benatardos. The extra material that I was going to tender went to uh, Mr Pudnick's, um, uh, I guess, interaction with other members of the SAFA and uh, a almost contemptuous um, uh, indication to them that he was continuing to operate his... Um, paraglider, notwithstanding the fact that he was no longer licensed, and that really just goes to um, it not being uh, reckless, isolated. It was clearly deliberate conduct. Well, I think that that's inherent in the uh, agreed facts. To be fair, I, I, well, I, I must say I inferred that from what yeah. was in the agreed facts that Mr. Pudnick had made a decision that he didn't want to have anything to do with the licensing authority anymore, and he was didn't think he needed to. Would that be fair, Mr Venetatos? Well, in relation to that, I can put it to you this way. He had a difficulty with SAFA. Um, they terminated his certificate. Um, he took the view that that... Firstly, they terminated for three months, then they extended it, and, so, and SAFA being the only body that was authorised to issue a certificate created a difficulty for him in terms of going... To, if he was going to be able to fly a term which I can now use based on your honour's finding. Um, he used it himself, to be fair. <laughs> I mean, he talked about flights. Anyway. Yeah, anyway, but, well, I suppose the issue there was the specific definition provided in the Act. Um, and then in, in August 2020, he in fact lodged an application under Part uh, 149 of... of what does it mean? I don't know. Anyway, he lodged an application with CASA seeking to have him set up his own club, which was to be authorised to be certified, provide the certifications, 
Um, that was taken on by CASA and they submitted he should make some revisions to his application, which he subsequently did in July 2021. CASA's never actually made a determination on that application um, to the point where he took that up issue to the AAT and they made a fine finding that as a CASA hasn't made a decision, there's no decision to review. So that application remained completely in limbo. So in terms of him being completely... Um, uh, Ignore, completely ignoring the fact that he hadn't received his certification in, in a way that's not quite true because he did seek to seek an alternative way of obtaining certification which has not to date been successful. Um, so, so therein lies that issue. Um, in relation to his... If you, does your not wish to hear further submissions um, at this point? Yes, I... I yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in well, relation I mean, to... Well, I, sorry, I would God. normally hear from... If Mr Clifford O'Sullivan wants to make any submissions about the appropriate penalty... I'm happy for him I'd to do that. I'd normally hear from the prosecutor first. Thank you. It's entirely a matter for you, though, whether you want to, Mr Yes, well, I, Your Honour, I think it, it's, there are some points that probably need to be made. Um, Your Honour adverted to the maximum penalty for each offence being two years. Uh, by Section 4, capital B2 of the Crimes Act... Um, Your Honour could also impose a fine. The pecuniary penalty for 20 capital A, capital B is 120 penalty units. So where do, where do you... Oh, I don't really need to know when... No, you, where I it provides it, a formula for converting... So, so terms what did you say, 120 penalty units? Yes, which is a $26,640 fine. Right. I think the prosecution would have to accept that Given 20 capital A, capital B uh, is drafted in contemplation of a very broad range of conduct and types of aircraft, a, uh, an aid to assessing uh, a, an appropriate yardstick for this kind of offending would be um, the regulatory offence provision that's provided, which is a maximum of 50, 50 penalty units. That's still $11,100. It's still a significant fine for each act. Um, clearly the prosecutor sought to proceed under the statutory offence, so it does have a greater maximum penalty. Why? I, I, is there any explanation for, for that? Uh, it's not a... wasn't a decision for me, Your Honour. Um, it just seems a little strange. People. I... I... anyway. Well, it's within the prosecutorial discretion. It may well, I don't have instructions on this, but it may well be simply because of the consistent repetition of the conduct that it was felt... Um, issuing fines for each particular instance. But maybe if they'd fined him for the first or second ones, maybe he would, would have stopped. I, I don't anyway, have any instructions on that. I mean, I take it that he could have been issued with... Uh, would he would he still have to have been brought to court under that regime, or is there a... I don't know. I, I don't think there's an infringement notice no. regime, but I don't have any instructions on that. there is. OK. So th that's not to say that the maximum penalty is 50 penalty units, but it, it, it probably gives... It's a relevant consideration for Your Honour in terms of assessing where on that scale of up to a $26,000 fine this conduct might fall. Um, there were 16 separate incidents over eight months. Uh, he knew his licence was expired. He knew he was it was required for flight. It wasn't reckless. It was clearly intentional and uh, contemulous, I think, is not an inaccurate description. <coughs> contemulous in respect of the regulatory regime that is set up for the purpose of protecting both participants in the sport and members of the public. Um, in terms of... The, I think the prosecution accepts that a fine would be an appropriate disposition in this matter. Um, Your Honour still has to make an assessment of what um, would be an appropriate severity in all the circumstances um, for each of the fines and then, subject to totality, what a cumulative uh, penalty would be appropriate. Sorry, can I just... I'm, I'm a, the Commonwealth sentencing regime is always something of a challenge. Yes. Can I impose an aggregate fine? I can, can't I? Your Honour, can yes. uh, the relevant provisions in the Crime Sentencing Procedure Act... Do, oh, um, well... I, sorry, I withdraw. No, no, Your Honour, can impose a global penalty under the Crimes under Act the crimes for a Act. fine, yes. It's, so, are you able to... I can, if Your Honour will give me a moment, yeah, I can I'm identify where that is myself, and so. refer you to it. Um, da, 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 da. Single fine for multiple offences, section 4K, 
commits the imposition of a single fine for multiple offences provided the charges are against the same Commonwealth provision and are founded on the same facts or form part of a series of similar offences. Would you accept that this is yes. precisely that situation? Yes, Your Honour. Just having a look at 4K. And in fact, these have been joined in the same information. Yes, summons, haven't they? So, sorry, go on, please. Um, in terms of the regulatory scheme, it's clearly there to protect both participants in the sport, but also members of the public. Uh, there is a decision, I haven't sought to provide it to you on it. It really is only relevant for demonstrating the risk to members of the public that can occur through incidents uh, involving aircraft that would be subject to regulation under Part 200. The decisions of Wardle and Kick and others, it's 2006, New South Wales Supreme Court, 327. That's a um, cautious case about uh, an injury suffered by a member of the public who was out walking one morning, was struck by a hang glider that was, hang that was um, flying in the relevant area, and he suffered a number of significant injuries sure you could be. that had an ongoing effect. So, but can I just ask, would you accept that somebody who hold, has held the relevant qualification and because, because as I said in my decision, there was nothing in the, this prosecution that required you to prove anything dangerous. No. Do you accept that I should deal with the matter on the basis that that wasn't proved? Well, the question is what the relevance of that is in terms well, of... Well, obviously, if somebody is charged with this because they've been, you know, never had any training and they've decided to jump off mountains and put themselves and other people at risk... Well, the, um, the, the, you know, willy-nilly, and, and they've in fact landed on somebody. Well, perhaps that might be a different offence. Well, that would be a more serious example of it. If well, they I mean, had... there may be a different offence, I don't know. Yes. Um, but... I mean, assuming that person had knowledge and understanding that there was a regulatory regime, decided not, not to bother um, applying and qualifying and gaining the skills, that would be um, a particularly serious example. Yes. The offending, though, there are two components. One is... Um, the need for the personal deterrence of Mr Pudnicks. He clearly was qualified up until the 31st of August. He didn't become un unqualified in the sense of his skills degraded overnight mm -hmm. as of the 1st September. Um, they are skills that do degrade over, the, over time, self-evidently, and they're skills that have to be practised. One of the requirements in the manual is, as there are for all aircraft, maintaining a certain amount of flight hours per month and per year, um, health checks, the purpose, the purpose of those regulations are to maintain the quality of the skills that are required to operate the aircraft. And the difficulty with the approach or the danger with the approach that Mr Pudnicks took in a very contemptuous um, indifference to the regulations is that it undermines the regulatory regime for everybody. And that has a flow-on effect, a risk for people both participating in the sport and for members of the public it's not necessarily the case that Mr Pudnicks himself represented a direct risk to any member of the public on each of those occasions, certainly early on, but his conduct in ignoring the regulatory regime of which he was previously a part of uh, invites others to do the same. And that goes to the heart of the purpose of the regulatory regime, which is to maintain consistent and safe standards for flight. And it is for that reason that there is a degree of a high degree of uh, need for general deterrence. Thank you. If this were a state offence, I'd have to take into account his financial circumstances. Is that the case? Your Honour, no Your Honour does have well, to have I regard to them so far as they know into the court, but it is not determinative no. of the outcome. That's in the Common is that in the Commonwealth Crimes Act? I'm sorry, I... Uh, yes, it's in 16 capital A... To 
Girl, you can monitor this. Large number of matters in 16. There are. It's a very long section. It might, may well be in a different section, Your Honour, if you want to give me a moment to find it, but it is, it is something Your Honour has to have regard to in imposing a, a pecuniary penalty. So, yeah, okay. So, 16 capital C subsection 1. Thank you. Before imposing a fine, the court must take into account the financial circumstances of the person, in addition to any other matters. Thank you. Uh, subsection 2, nothing prevents the court from imposing a fine because of the financial circumstances. Um, oh, yes, okay. Cannot be ascertained. Um, uh, it was a course of conduct. I mean, that has an impact both ways. Uh, your Honour, obviously it has to come to a uh, penalty that is subject to the totality principle, but it's clearly not an isolated incident. There was no plea of guilty. Um, there is a high degree of need for personal deterrence in the prosecution submission. Uh, there was no contrition shown in the prosecution submission um, for the purposes of, of Part 1A. Uh, Your Honour is still uh, entitled to have regard to Mr Pudnick's facilitating the course of justice, which is, was clearly evident in um, the hearing proceeding by way of a statement of agreed facts under section 191. There were clearly significant savings to the court, um, which is relevant both to, well, would have been relevant to the utilitarian value um, if there had been a plea, but it's still relevant, notwithstanding the fact there wasn't a plea. Uh, he's 40 years old, so there's no benefit um, in terms of youth. Uh, he's a professional, and but as I indicated earlier, doesn't have any prior convictions. Thank you. Um, those are the prosecution submissions, Your Honour. Yes, Mr. Benetatis. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, in relation to that last point about the facilitation of the course of justice, I think this matter was originally going to be listed for five days, given the number of witnesses that were involved and Mr Pudnick's cooperation in that regard was fairly substantial, um, but to reduce it just down to the expert being the main, the only prosecution witness in the matter. Sorry, just before I do hear from you, mm. can I just ask Mr Clifton Sullivan another question? Um, Mr Benatalis did say something about his client having made application to CASA to become a licensing authority. Is, is that accepted, that that... There is a, a decision of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal um, um, so, is it accepted that well, it's he's accepted taken that some steps to try to become lawful in whatever the circumstances uh, are? That it's accepted to... that some material was submitted to CASA right. uh, for that purpose. The AAT decision records that CASA was the view that the application was incomplete and that right. Mr Pudnick's... Um, but there's been something done. That's accepted. Well, something... It may or may never w result in anything, yes. but it's not as though the defendant has just completely ignored the licensing regime. Si well, since this prosecution started... Well, I don't have any instructions on whether the steps that were taken by the defendant were um, open to him in terms of some parallel process that would allow him to operate and create um, his own club. There is a single authority under the regulations whether... I know, but, but there's capacity for a second one. You know, this is Australia. Presumably, I don't know anything about the background to any of this, but those are voluntary organisations, which uh, well, no, they're organi they are voluntary organisations, but organisations that are recognised through yeah. the regulatory system and approved by CASA as being right. the responsible body yes. for a particular class of aircraft. Yes. Um, I think the prosecution accepts Mr Pudnick's believes he was taking some steps to do something right. in the alternative. Whether there was Whether any possibility of that being legitimate or effective, yeah. um, I don't have any instructions on. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, Mr. Benetanis. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, as my friend indicated, Mr. Pudnick is 40 years old. He has no prior records. He's currently working for a local construction business in a sales administration role. He's had that position for the last 10 to 12 months and he's earning approximately $1,100 per week net from that, about seventy five to 85000 per annum. His only fixed commitment is his rent, which is at $550 per week. He has no um, substantial assets or um, investments of any regard apart from some superannuation. In relation to his prior work life, he was employed by the, sorry, he was contracted by the Department of Defence for a period of 15 years. Um, in, in the field of um, this one, I I lost it. Uh, as, an, as a as a systems engineer working in technical risk and regulations, that was from 2006 to 2021, doing work for the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force over that time, and that employment, well, that contractual situation terminated in 2021 when he obtained this his current employment. Um, um, he has held, well, he had held a paragliding certificate from 2015 until um, early 2020. Um, prior to that, he had been a qualified kite, server, kite surfer from 2010, and he's undertaken 10 hours um, training in a, an aeroplane as a pilot in a light sport aircraft. Um, None of that can go any further, given his current situation um, with What's Castor and Saturn. kite surfer? Do you have to have qualifications oh. to do kite surfing? So I might have misspoke on that. I, I'm just asking out of interest. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, my, my fault. He, he started thought. kite surfing in 2010 and was doing that. My, I, mean, he, I don't yes. imagine there's much of that around Blackheath. No, no. And then I think you you have found the regulations didn't require a permit to kite surf. Um, so, so he's been taking on those sorts of sports for some time. Um, as my friend acknowledged, he was a he had a certificate PG4, which ranked him at the second highest level of um, certification, and has had many hours experience. Um, and as my friend also conceded, this section covers a broad range of potential conduct, um, including aeroplanes down to paragliders. Um, in terms of risk of harm to the public, I'd submit to you that it was at the low end, um, um, if, if at all, given his experience and given the, the alleged facts in relation to what, sorry, the facts of his um, flying in these circumstances. Um, the issue becomes, I think, mainly for the prosecution in terms of um, maintaining the integrity of the regime and, 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 and enforcing that. And, um, Mr. Pudnicks did something which required them to make an example of him, and that's why I anticipate it's gone to, into, to, to a prosecution under the Act rather than the regulations. Um, I, I thank my friend for his concession that the matter should be appropriately dealt with by way of a fine. Um, I, I'm I note Your Honour's comments about um, a global penalty being posed. Um, I anticipate Your Honour will feel the need to impose a conviction and, and impose a penalty on him, um, but I'd ask Your Honour to, in making that, determining the amount of that penalty, reflect on um, the risk to the public, the level of the risk to the public, which I've already submitted, was very low. This is more um, in the reins of, if I can put it, uh, an administrative offence in terms of if he was someone who refused to get certif certified and refused to obtain appropriate training and qualifications in the first instance, that would be a far more serious offence than someone who's already reached Certificate 4 level of qualification and experience. Um, and, and, and should be treated as such. Um, Your Honour, unless there's anything else that could assist you, I think that takes it. Just one minute. Um, he also t reaffirms to me that he did lodge that part 149 with, with, um, with CASA and 
he indicates to me that the level of quality and safety reflected in that application was higher than that in SAFA, but I can't take that as in, t in terms of compared to SAFA's qualifications and requirements. Um, but I don't have the documentation to establish that, so I'll just make that submission on instructions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, I've just found Mr. Padlick's guilty of uh, 16 offences contrary to Section 20AB of the Civil Aviation Act, which, as has been indicated, carries maximum penalty for each offence of two years' imprisonment. Uh, Cars, representative for CASA today concedes that an appropriate penalty in the circumstances would be a fine, so I don't propose to uh, give any further reference to the other alternatives that might be available to prison um, in light of that concession, and, and I have to say it's one with which I entirely agree. The alternative to imprisonment under Section 20AB uh, includes a pecuniary penalty, uh, which is expressed in penalty units, but for each offence involves a maximum penalty of 26,000, a pecuniary penalty of $26,640. Uh, but again, Mr Clifford O'Sullivan has accepted that the penalty available under the regulatory offence, uh, which is 50 penalty units or a fine of $11,100, is a relevant uh, guidepost for this type of conduct. These are Commonwealth offences and I am permitted by um, uh, the Commonwealth Legislation Section, sorry, the Crimes Act 2014, Section 4, capital K, to impose a global penalty for offences which form part of um, the sorry, a, uh, which uh, are charges against the same person for any number of offences against the same provision of a law of the Commonwealth that are joined in the same information, complaint or summons if founded on the same facts or form part of a series of offences of the same or a similar character. Subsection 4 of Section 4K provides that if a person is convicted of two or more offences referred to in subsection 3, the court may impose one penalty in respect of all of those offences, but that penalty shall not exceed the sum of the maximum penalties that could be imposed if a separate penalty were imposed in respect of each offence. The maximum, of course, is a guidepost only, and as has been accepted in relation to the section 20AB offence, this conduct by Mr Pudnick's must fall at the lowest, lower end of the range of objective seriousness for offences under that provision, given that that provision applies to every form of aircraft that is regulated by uh, the civil aviation regulations, including, of course, uh, jet aircraft and other much larger items than a paraglider as operated by Mr Pudnick's. Um, clearly the objective seriousness also requires uh, me to have regard to danger to the community and uh, whilst I certainly accept that there is some danger to the community in a person who is um, in a, not certified to operate a paraglider operating it in the way that Mr Pudnick's has, um, I would certainly accept that the fact that he has, until August 2020, um, had the relevant certification and had um, was uh, essentially certified to fly the paraglider that he was flying is relevant to the objective seriousness of the offence as well. That is, at, at up until the point in August 2020, he at least had the relevant skills to be able to actually operate that um, aircraft uh, potentially in a way that re reduced danger to members of the community. But 
certainly it is serious that Mr Pudnick's has continued to do that, knowing that he required to be licensed. Um, I'm informed that he has made some application to CASA to set up a separate uh, regulatory agency, noting that SAFA is the agency which is authorised under the regulations to certify people to fly paragliders and that there has apparently, and I know no more detail than this about it, been some um, disagreement between Mr Pudnick's and SAFA such that his certification was not uh, renewed, although it's not at all clear to me whether, from these agreed facts whether that was a result of action by SAFA or whether it was a resu result of a choice by Mr Pudnick's. But whatever the case, after August of 2020, he knew he shouldn't have been flying the paraglider and he continued to do so on the 16 occasions that have been the subject of this prosecution. The matters I'm required to take into account in determining what penalties are to be imposed under um, Commonwealth law are set out in section 16 capital A and also in relation to fines in section, section 16 capital C of the Commonwealth Crimes Act. Crimes Act. Um, the circumstances of these offences were that Mr Pudnick's continued to operate as I have just found, knowing that he wasn't certified to do so, but believing that he didn't need to be. Uh, clearly that belief was wrong. I um, note that it was a course of conduct consisting of similar acts. There are no direct victims of this offence, apart from, of course, um, the... Uh, Sorry, there are no direct victims of uh, this, these offences and there is no direct injury, loss or damage resulting from any of them. Certainly I would accept that Mr Pudnix has not shown any contrition for these offences, although, I, as I've said, he has apparently tried to obtain some certification in some other way than is currently provided for by the regulations. Um, that is something that clearly if Mr Pudnix wish, wishes to continue to operate a paraglider, he either needs to sort things out with SAFA or have some other um, proposal approved, approved by CASA because one simply cannot fly these uh, things, aircraft, without appropriate certification under the rules. Um, I note that... Uh, he pleaded not guilty, but he has facilitated the course of justice in the way in which the hearing was conducted, as is accepted, and uh, I do accept, take that into account in determining the appropriate penalty as well. I'd also accept that he thinks, probably still thinks, but certainly thought there was a genuine issue to be determined, um, and certainly, as I've said, facilitated the course of justice in enabling it to be determined in the most efficient way possible. He's 40 years of age, I'm told. He has no prior criminal record, and that certainly suggests he is not a person who is in the habit of breaching the law. Um, I note that he's apparently employed, uh, and on the material before me, I could not find that he isn't um, likely to be able to be appropriately rehabilitated uh, and to reconsider the consequences of his actions. I accept that he does need to be personally deterred from continuing to uh, operate in the way that he has in the course of this um, conduct. Um, and I also accept that other members of the public need to be deterred from seeking to emulate Mr Pudnick's by um, taking risks in relation to uh, this quite dangerous sport. Um, without appropriate certification. I do consider a pecuniary penalty is appropriate. I uh, do consider that these are matters where um, a global penalty is appropriate as well. Certainly the maximum available is extremely significant. I'm told that Mr Pudnix earns $1,100 a week out of which he pays rent of $550 a week and uh, has the, presumably the ordinary expenses that general members of the public do. 
I have no direct evidence of it, but I'm told he has limited assets. I have to take that into account in determining the appropriate penalty to be imposed. I have to say that uh, were I determining a single offence um, of this nature, I would consider a fine in the uh, hundreds of dollars to be appropriate given the uh, nature of the global offending. It seems to me that a fine um, appropriately related to the 16 occasions um, should be imposed as a global penalty. In respect of each of the offences, Mr Pudnix is convicted. In respect of all each of the offences, had they been a single count, I would have imposed a penalty of $600 fine, but I, in terms of the 16 counts, I propose to impose a global penalty, uh, which is a pecuniary penalty of $9,600 which is uh, 16 times 600 for anybody who's counting. The uh, overall pecuniary penalty, Mr Pudnix, to be paid by you is a fine of $9,600. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything further, Mr Clifford O'Sullivan? No, Your Honour. Um, anything further, Mr. Benitatos? Thank you. All right, I uh, will adjourn. Mr. Clifford O'Sullivan, I have got that hard copy legislation. I've left it outside. Can I give it back to you? Yes, is, it, is it of any use to you? No. <laughs> uh, you want to, want to do something appropriate with it for yes. the environment? Give it to someone else doing an aviation case or something? I've never seen so much legislation. But it was very useful having it in hard copy, can I say? I'll give it back, though. Thank you. Yes. I'll adjourn. Is this like a court's temporary adjournment?